Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever met someone famous? That's a, that's a question that you might use to start a conversation with someone. That's also something you might take pride in a little bit. The closest I ever got to answering that question is that I have a picture with Nolan Ryan, arguably the greatest pitcher in baseball's history. I never really actually met him, but I got a picture with him. I have an autograph from him. Uh, it's, a, it's a special moment. I remember it. It was about seven, eight years ago, and I was at a Round Rock Express minor league baseball game. So Round Rock is just north of Austin, and that's where the Round Rock Express are. Nolan Ryan, I don't know if he's like the owner of the team. He's a major player in that organization. And every game, every home game, he leaves about the seventh inning. I had no idea about this. But my friend who I was with, who loves baseball, loves getting autographs, all that kind of stuff, turned to me and said, Ben, do you want to go get Nolan Ryan? And I said, sure. And he said, well, that's him right there. And there was Nolan walking away. So we went. I asked for an autograph. I got it. I got a picture as well, which is special. You don't normally ask Hall of Famers for two things, apparently. Anywho, that's the closest I've ever met. And I could put that picture up, but that's probably all you'd think about is the famous person that you had seen. One neat thing about famous people when you meet them is that you kind of get to share in a little bit of their prestige or glory or fame because now you can say, look at me in conversation. I've met Nolan Ryan. Or you could say that to me about who uh, and what famous person you have met. They draw us to them. We see that in the pictures and all the people following around them. We, we see that as we want to be with them. We want to meet them. We want to see them. Today, I want us to think about how we want to see those famous people, but translate that into how we want to see Jesus. Because Jesus, the most famous person, the best person, draws us to him and so that we're always having that desire to see him. But Jesus doesn't just want us to see him in the way we want to see him, to catch him for a quick autograph. No, he wants us to see him in his glory. Today he's going to explain what that means. But he also wants us to see him then in our lives of service to him and the certainty we have that he gives us. We learn this through John chapter 12. And here Jesus, at some of the height of his ministry, has just entered into to Palm Sunday, on, or just entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, with the people singing his praises, and there's some people, some Greeks, that want to see him. Listen to the word of God from John chapter 12. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the gospel of our Lord. Those Greeks wanted to see Jesus, and there's no surprise in that. Jesus was a famous person. He was celebrity, and for good reason. Everyone wanted to see Jesus. He had driven out demons with just, just by speaking. He had healed the sick, performed many other miracles, and the one probably standing out in people's minds right at this moment because it had happened so recently was the raising of Lazarus from the dead. People wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to be by him. He was the guy who entered into Jerusalem with the songs and the praises of the people. 
wasn't just his miracles that drew people to Jesus, that made people want to see him. It was also his teaching. Throughout the Gospels, the people often say, he teaches as one with authority, and not like the rest of the teachers. Everything about Jesus was drawing people to him. And those Greeks who were in Jerusalem because they had converted to Judaism to celebrate the Passover were there. And they wanted to see Jesus. I don't blame them. We don't need to look into what reason it was, put the best construction on it. They, they saw Jesus, saw what he had done, knew the scriptures and said, is this the guy? They went and found two of Jesus' disciples, Philip and Andrew. Interesting that both of those guys have Greek names. Maybe they felt more comfortable about, around them. And they go and say, we want to see Jesus. Philip and Andrew then, in turn, take that request to Jesus. And you'd think Jesus would maybe stop and talk to them and explain to them who he was. But we don't really know what happened. See, those Greeks, they get us right to Jesus, and then they kind of disappear. And instead, Jesus answers the question for us and for his disciples, and maybe for those Greeks, if they were right there, what does it mean to see me? He said something interesting. He said, now is the hour for the, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. We know what's about to happen with Jesus. He had entered into Jerusalem to the songs and praises of people. And maybe they're thinking, yes, the Messiah is going to sit on the throne, but we know what's going to happen. We know where he's going to go. We know why he came. And Jesus explains this actually in the next verse to his people, to those listening to him. He came to die. And what was going to happen, is that really glory? When you read through the suffering and, and death of Jesus, is that really glory? To be whipped and beaten to the point that you can't even carry the cross? To go to the cross and die? Is that really glory? But that's where Jesus wants us to see him. The hour has come. Up until this point, throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus is always saying and constantly saying, the hour has not come. As people are looking for him to exercise his power, he says, now is not the time. Now is not the time. The hour, my hour, has not come until right now. Now it's come. You want to see me? Watch what happens. You want to see me glorified? This is what it looks like. He explains it in a parable. And he says, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. It's a really neat way to think about what Jesus came to do. How he's going to be glorified. It's not sitting him powerfully in Jerusalem, ruling and throwing off the Romans. It's him going to the cross to die. To produce many seeds. Think about it. A seed is just a seed. Small, not very glorious. A seed that falls to the ground and doesn't germinate and sprout and grow. It's not very glorious. A seed, though, that breaks down, germinates, grows, sprouts up, produces a flower or fruit or crop, whatever it is, that's glorious. And where is the glory of that seed and what it produced? What is Jesus telling you? He's saying, I'm going to the cross, and the seed I'm going to produce in my death is forgiveness and life and salvation for you and for me and for the whole world. The cover today on today's bulletin, the artist captured it really well. Look at it if you have it. There you have Jesus at the cross, and you can see that trickle of blood flowing down from the cross, and what do you see on the ground but little seeds sprouting forth? Jesus wants us to see his glory in his death and in his resurrection because that is why he came, to forgive us and to save us. This is the whole reason why he came to this earth, is to get to this point to bring God's salvation to the world. If you want to see Jesus, go to the cross. If you want to see your Savior, you find him there at the cross. You see him and his love and all that he's done for you. He's telling those Greeks, his disciples and us, you want to see me and you want to see glory, this is what it looks like. But then he goes on more. We see Jesus and we know why he came, but he then explains how to see Jesus every day in our lives. And what he says isn't what you'd normally expect. He says, anyone who loves his life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Again, that's a tough saying. 
may be difficult to understand. Those who love their life are going to lose it. But I thought life is a gift from God. Isn't it good to want to be alive and to live? And those who hate their lives are going to keep it? Have you seen someone who's hated their life? Who's filled with despair and angerness and anger and bitterness? Who thinks, I just got to get out of here. We would often say to them, maybe, maybe you need to go talk to someone. Right? That's, that's hard. Is that what Jesus is saying, though? Just those two things? No, he's, he's taking it a little bit different direction. Did you catch it? Those who love their life will lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. One of the things that we often want in life is a glory, glorified life, right? We, we want a life that's easy, without problems. We want a life that's no struggle. And if there was no struggle, then I would have it. We want a life according to our will and how it might look. We, that's the life we want, and we have this death grip on it. We have this death grip not to lose it. We will do anything to find our life right here and right now so that we have the glory right here and right now. But Jesus says, if you hold on to that life like this, looking for all of it here right now, you're going to lose it. But if you hate this life in this world, you will keep it. Think about what Isaiah was telling the people at that time. God's people were going to be going into exile, and then Isaiah at this time is speaking to a future people who had come back from exile. And did you notice the, the message Isaiah was telling them? Pastor Brown so beautifully gave it to the children. He says, fear not, I called you by name, you're mine, when you go through the water, when you go through the fire, not if you go through the water or if you go through the fire, when you do those things, what's the promise? I will be with you. God already tells us that the glorified life that we think we want in this world with no problem that we say, Lord, I, I want to see this in my life. Aren't you acting accordingly by making it happen? And if you're not, what's going on? God says, no, that's not how it looks. But rather, anyone who hates his life in this world will keep it. We trust in the Lord. We have eternal life. And he he explains a little bit further what that looks like to hate your life in this world. In the next few phrases, he says, whoever serves me must follow me. Jesus did not come into this world to be served, right? But to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came into this world to serve, to lower himself to the lowest point, even death on the cross, so that we would have life. He calls us to follow him. To hate our life means to put our needs and our wants and our desires to the side and to put everyone else's needs and wants and desires above ours. Most importantly, to put God's wants and needs and desires above ours. To follow Jesus serving and humbling ourselves under our Father's will, just like he did. Whoever serves me must follow me. We hate our lives by constantly dying to ourselves, to live for Christ, to serve those. That's where Jesus says, in service to others, you see me. You see me as you follow me, because whoever serves me follows me. And then Jesus gives us some wonderful comfort in our lives of service to others. He gives us some reality. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where my servant is, where I am, my servant also will be, not might be, but will be, reality, and my Father will honor the one who serves me. That's the reality of Jesus. That's the reality he gives you and me. We know those are to be true because of our baptism, right? We follow Christ in our baptism. It connects us to him. Our, his death and his resurrection are now ours. We, we follow him, and where he is, we will be. He's with us always, and we will be with him in eternal life. And whoever serves him, the Father will honor. We often do things to get attention and garner praise, right? And it's not wrong to be appreciated. Not, not a bad thing to feel appreciated. But think about even taking a picture with Nolan Ryan and me telling it to you. What is that little part of me hoping that you come up to me and say, oh, wow, 
That must have been really neat to meet Mr. Ryan, huh? And, and, and when we do those things, we want to share in a little bit of someone else's glory so that we have glory. We do things at times to serve others, maybe not just to put our needs away, but so that someone might notice and say, look at how good you are, right? We do things for our, ourselves, seeking the honor and praise of others. But when we hate our lives in this world, following after our Savior, that's going to be really hard. It's not always going to garner praise. But what does Jesus tell us? My Father will honor you. And it's not because of what you have done, but because of what Christ has done for you. We know at the last day, what will our Father in heaven do but call to us and declare us not guilty? In our baptisms, what has God done? He's wrapped Jesus all the way around us so that when the Father looks at us, he sees his perfect Son, so the only thing he can say about us is holy, blameless, righteous. We serve our God knowing that it's Jesus who has given us this honor. This is the reality in which we live. And when Jesus helps us see him in those things, it takes our eyes off of finding the glory in this world and keeping them fixed on him at the cross. Jesus continues to give us certainty continues to help us see him at this cross. He continues to help us see him clearly in our lives. And the next few verses, he really nails that down for us. After he, he explains to us what our life of service is like, how we see Jesus in, in his glory at his death, how we see Jesus in our lives of service, he then gives us the certainty because he wants us to see his commitment to us. He said, now my soul is troubled. And the picture there is, is like water churning up sediment so it's unclear and kind of chaotic and all disturbed. And, and he says, that's, that's me right now. I'm troubled, I'm disturbed because he knows as full human, true human, what he's about to face. He's about to face terrible death and suffering. Even more so, he's about to face the torments of hell. And he's troubled. But what does he say? Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard and said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said the voice was for your benefit. Jesus wants you to be certain that these realities he gives you, that his glory at the cross is all for you. He could have ran away. We heard him pray in the garden, Lord, if there's any other way, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Jesus' whole life and his purpose was to come to this point. Father, save me from this hour. No, it's for this reason I came, for this hour, to go to the cross to produce great fruit, the fruit of forgiveness and peace and life eternal. Jesus wants us to see that. He wants us to see how committed he was and is to saving us. He, he tells us that all of this is happening for our benefit so that we see our loving Savior. Now is the time of judgment, Jesus says. Now the prince of this world is driven out. When Jesus went to the cross, the judgment on the world happened. Did you catch that? He's not saying later at judgment day. He's saying now. When he went to the cross, he took on the sins of all the world, your sins and mine, the times we've tried to find glory in this life, find glory in ourselves, the times we, we haven't been as committed as he was to the cross, to our own crosses. He's taken all of that on himself, and he's paid for it. Judgment has happened, not guilty, sins forgiven because of the Son of God who died. And the prince of this world, the devil has been driven out. So that when the devil comes and accuses you and me, when he says, how could you even think you're a Christian after what you've done? How could you even think that you're part of God's people? How could you even think that your Savior, who you claim to be your Savior, thinks and loves you after all the sin in your life? He's been driven out. He's been crushed. His power destroyed because the Son of Man came and died and rose. That's our Savior's judgment for us. And at the cross... We see that all. We see that all for us, that he did all of this for us to give us forgiveness so that you know, without a doubt, your judgment is fully forgiven, fully loved, fully at peace with God, 
having the full eternal life with him forever. That's where we see Jesus. Right there at the cross. And like every other famous person, Jesus draws us to himself. That last part is what stands out to me here especially. He says, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Says that to show the kind of death that he's going to die to the cross. But I, I think about what he's saying. I will draw all people to myself. I will do it. When I met Nolan Ryan, again, he put met in quotation marks, because does he remember my name? No. Does he remember the three words I said to him? No. Do you think he remembers half the people he meets? No, that's part of when you're having a a celebrity and you, you have people drawn to you, you're not always the kindest, or you don't always remember, because there's so many, and if you were them, put yourself in their shoes, would you want that much attention all the time? For a moment, yes, but then after a while, it would be nice to have some peace and quiet. When people meet the, a, a celebrity idol of theirs that they really wanted to meet, maybe you can remember, like me, there's certain stories that you've heard from your friends, maybe fourth hand, fifth hand, where they said, I was so excited to meet this person, we were all drawn to him, and then they were mean, kind of a jerk. And instead of drawing me to them and, and respecting them, I, I've lost a lot of respect for them. That's not Jesus. He's not going to meet you and then forget your name and forget who you are. He's not going to forget the interactions with you. Rather, what does he want? He wants to draw you to himself, and he has through his word and the sacraments. He's gathered you underneath his arms. He's called you by name. You are his. He does this so that you will be with him forever. Be Jesus in that. See your Savior as he is lifted up on the cross this Lenten season. See Jesus and the glory that that brings to him and his Father and that he also gives to you. We'd like to see Jesus. By God's grace, we do. We see him every time we open the word. We see him all the time at the cross. By God's grace, we'll see him face to face in heaven. We'd like to see Jesus. Thank the Lord he'll give us that. Amen.